This is the final session of our Seeking Truth Through Facts Future of US China Conference. Session six is on Chinese succession in 2022, prospects for President Xi and implications for China's global ambitions. Moderating is Stanford's Larry Diamond with speakers Joseph Felter and Ling Ling Wei. Larry. Thank you, Margaret. Um, what a tremendous conference it's been so far. Uh, my only regret is that um, we can't be together in person, but I look forward to that happening next year. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, two panelists that I'm gonna converse with, and then you all are gonna converse with uh, in this next hour. Ling Ling Wei, whose superb reporting has already been referred to, is the chief China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and co-author of Superpower Showdown. She covers China's political economy, focusing on the intersection of business and politics. In 2021, that is last year, she was among a team of reporters and editors whose work was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Joseph Felter, my colleague at Stanford, is the Will William J. Perry Fellow at Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation, and also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. From 2017 to 2019, he served as a US Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Oceania. A former US Army Special Forces and Foreign Area Officer, Joe served in a variety of special operations and diplomatic assignments across East and Southeast Asia uh, before assuming the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense role. So uh, we're gonna talk now uh, in a broader way uh, about uh, both the internal politics of the People's Republic of China and the great succession, or in a way perhaps non-succession question, uh, and then the implications for China's global ambition. So we'll, be ending where we started uh, with the very broad canvas uh, that uh, Kevin Rudd uh, brilliantly began to paint for us. Uh, and uh, Ling Ling, uh, if I may, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, in uh, October of this year, uh, the Communist Party of China will hold, uh, as Kevin Rudd uh, indicated in his remarks, its historic 20th Party Congress which will choose new Communist Party leaders for China. Uh, is there, a, I mean, Rudd put the odds at 80% that Xi Jinping uh, would um, once again be uh, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Is there any doubt in your mind that having already engineered the lifting of the two term limit for the presidency that she will return to the Supreme leadership for a third term as general secretary and then be reelected as president uh, next spring? First of all, uh, thank you very much, Larry, for the introduction. It's great uh, to be here with you and Joe, and thank you to Asia Society for the invite. Um, to your question, uh, I think that bet uh, made by Mr. Rudd uh, is a pretty good one. Um, it, there, uh, there's a very, very strong indication that President Xi Jinping will be able to manage what he's been trying to do for the past 10 years, which is uh, really break the established six, uh, system of succession and remain in power. Uh, I would say not just for one more term, perhaps for three more terms uh, as uh, president, uh, the paramount leader of China. So uh, when it comes to Chinese politics, um, it, it's really interesting. Um, China has always vacillated between one man rule and collective leadership for the past more than, uh, uh, for the past cen uh, half century. Um, you know, beginning with Mao Zedong, uh, right after the founding of the communist China, even he had to share power with other revolutionaries, right? And then obviously he really enforced his dominance and um, you know, uh, consolidated power. And the result was he plunged 
China into decades of chaos that killed tens of millions of people. Then you see what he, uh, his successor, Deng Xiaoping, did. Deng Xiaoping uh, basically launched this reform and opening and also established rules for sharing and ceding power. Now, under Xi Jinping, we're back to the one man rule again. You know, he's made himself the chairman of everything in charge of uh, armed forces, foreign policy, economy, you name it. So, um, you know, uh, and it's, it's um, he's, he, obviously he's offended a lot of people. There's, there's a lot of unhappiness and resentment within the party, but not nearly enough to really challenge him. We see that from the recently passed third history resolution, right? There's very little history in that whole document. The whole purpose really is to affirm the party's leadership and uh, she's personal leadership of the, of the party. So, um, but, you know, if you read really carefully, you do see some tensions and, and Xi Jinping trying to balance the, you know, uh, different demands from different interest groups. So that definitely is reflected in there. However, and, and you know, with, uh, with his anti-corruption campaign and his emphasis on obedience, loyalty, absolute loyalty and austerity, you know, obviously a lot of people not happy, you know, some party officials are so unhappy and scared uh, to some extent to the point that they're not willing or, um, you know, daring to do anything because they don't want to get in trouble. So, but that aside, there's really no meaningful challenge to his rule unless, um, you know, there's some kind of huge crisis, um, you know, that were to occur in the coming year. Um, you know, we're already seeing that China really is continuing this very draconian approach to dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. You know, the, in the US, new cases are like more than a million uh, on a daily basis. In China, they locked down the entire city based on less than 10 cases in a single digit. So that shows the kind of, uh, you know, in a way it's paranoia and the insecurity. They're doing everything to keep the society stable and secure almost at, at all costs, you know, in a way, you know, beneath all the obsession of um, security and um, uh, stability is probably a sense of insecurity. So that shows that we cannot really completely dismiss um, the notion of some kind of challenge to his power, but we're not seeing the challenge meaningful enough to stop him from, you know, continuing to rule China. I think the big, uh, one big challenge for him is, you know, whether or not he's going to put all his people into those positions. That would be a really, you know, big challenge. Obviously, you know, he would want to put as many people loyal to him into important positions as possible. Whether or not he can do that, that is a question. What, uh, I, I want to ask a broader question, but as long as you've raised it, uh, it's not October yet, but October has a way of uh, coming very quickly. What are the positions we should be looking at? Presumably, uh, the members of the Politburo Standing Committee, but he key portfolios within it. What are the key positions he wants to control or needs to control? Sure. Uh, in the very near term, uh, we should be on the lookout for some key local positions, right? Uh, very recently, we saw the personnel uh, in, in a way, surprise personnel change in Xinjiang uh, and more to come, uh, obviously, in the next few months involving really important localities, including Shanghai, Chongqing, Zhejiang, Guangdong, right? Those are all, you know, very important, uh, most also most economically developed places in China, we're going to have a sense of uh, whether how successful uh, she would be in terms of uh, installing his own people. And obviously there's the standing committee, 
you know, there are a lot of speculations in China these days about, you know, potentially, um, you know, she wants to shrink the influence of the size of the standing committee, um, you know, or even scrap it altogether. Um, so we're going to see, you know, whether or not he can manage to do that because, you know, the standing committee is interesting. It, it, it you know, uh, the size of the standing committee also tra has changed over time. It used to be nine and now seven. The rumors about potentially downsides even further to five. Um, so there, there are a lot of moving parts. And, and another thing we should uh, be on the lookout for is that obviously factionalism in China is not that, you know, she has to really battle with other uh, interest groups and other power uh, factions, including the youth league faction. So we're going to see uh, whether people like Li Keqiang, um, you know, get to stay, you know, if the uh, precedence uh, is to be observed, Li Keqiang should stay on for another term because he's only uh, 67, you know, not over 67 yet. So, so there, there are a lot of uh, things we should, we should be on the lookout for. It couldn't be, you know, fantastically confusing for many months to come, but also, you know, hugely interesting for us, to, uh, China watchers. Well, um, we'll be reading your reporting and that Thank of your you. colleagues uh, in the next few months to interpret the tea leaves of, um, of these appointments and developments. Let's assume uh, that the 80% probability uh, transpires uh, and she gets his third five-year term in power uh, with an expectation at that point that term limits are gone and he can remain as long as he wants to. What, what is that going to mean? Uh, there's a debate about whether this deepening and extension of his power would make him even more autocratic or give him the security to engage in more serious and far-reaching internal reforms. What would you bet on? Um, me? Did Larry? you hear me? Uh, is that a question for me? Yeah, sorry. yeah. I, uh, sorry, that's directed to you again, and then I'll okay. Okay, um, I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to monopolize the whole discussion, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. brief. Don't, don't worry, Joe's <laughs> going to have a lot to say. I'm oh, taking awesome. notes and learning a lot, Ling Ling. Please continue. No, not at all. Uh, you know, obviously, that's, that's a huge question, whether or not, you know, this uh, um, more power would give him, you know, the confidence to finally push forward some reforms or act more like an autocrat. Um, I, I think, you know, so far the signs um, haven't been uh, encouraging. Over the past year, we have seen, you know, he basically um, has launched this um, sweeping economic purge, you know, uh, done for political purposes, ideological purposes, and, you know, moving away from China's decades revolution towards Western style capitalism, but, you know, more back into the socialist spirit of the Mao era. So that's what he did um, in the past year. Um, you know, are there any signs that he might switch gear and finally, you know, make some market reforms and political reforms? We're really not seeing that. Um, you know, one thing uh, the previous panel suggested is, you know, competition between the U.S. and China these days. You know, it's, it's really um, giving uh, the more hawkish forces in Beijing, um, greater, um, uh, how to say, incentives to really double down on whatever they have been doing. The, you know, more subsidies for state companies, asking state private businesses to act more like state firms. Um, you know, the party controls everything. Years of effort to separate the party from day-to-day -day government. That experiment is all but over. And I have to say that um, when I, after I read the third history resolution, um, I was um, really stunned by the fact that uh, all the mentioning of reform and opening is in past tense. 
in the resolution. You know, they um, and Xinhua News Agency also published a, a summary of the six main tasks for decades going forward, and you don't see they list reform and opening. Uh, as one of those six tasks also missing in the summary is seeking facts, uh, seeking truth from facts. You know, all those things are, you know, uh, the hallmarks of the reform era. And, and, and at least, I'm not saying it's completely abandoned, but at least downplayed um, dramatically. And on the other hand, you know, the emphasis on security, it's basically um, permeating China's economic plan. So when you, you, you think so um, much about security and how to make sure um, you know can uh, ensure your uh, ensure the control it's hard to think that there any opening or window of opportunity to carry out um, you know reforms to make the you know the system more democratic or uh, liberal <clears throat> well a wonderful analysis it's a it's a grim scenario um Let's now turn to Joe. Um, first of all, Joe, uh, I think we'd all welcome any uh, reflections you have on Ling, Lin Ling's assessment of the direction uh, of China's um, uh, leadership uh, moment uh, of uh, uh, reinforcement and perpetuation or uh, succession and uh, more importantly, what it means for China's foreign policy uh, and military posture in the region. One gets nervous uh, uh, to hear the speculation that this trend may well strengthen hawks in China, hawks in terms of domestic repression, but hawks in terms of a, um, a posture toward the region that's gotten pretty uh, aggressive and um, uh, assertive and wolf warrior-like uh, in the last number of years. So you've had to think about this with respect to South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, with respect to the South China Sea. And of course, we're all concerned about the future of Taiwan. So how do you assess the implications of this for uh, regional security? Uh, well, th first of all, th th thanks, Larry. Thanks for uh, uh, our, our, you know, the Asia side for a chance to join you. And uh, Ling Ling, I'm already learned quite a bit in the, the first few minutes from taking notes. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I, I, Larry, you know, I taught international relations here here, here at Stanford and, and at West Point, and uh, just put a big a big theory frame here. You know, you know, we think that national interests drive policy, and we should expect continuity. Um, but I think everyone will agree that a lot of China's actions. You know, Lingling mentioned that all the domestic ac activities, but it's, you know, she is driving so much of what China is doing, you know, personally. And, and you know, I, I would argue he's, he's made a lot of miscalculations uh, across the region and, 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 and abroad and, and argue he's, he, he's been, you know, reckless and, and, and prone to, to overreach. Um, and I, so I think his actions are, are going to be a big, big problem for China. And certainly if he gets this next term, if the 80 percent comes through, and I probably even guess is probably more than that of a chance. I, he, we're going to anticipate more of the same, um, you know, if, he, if he's given this, this next term. Um, you know, Lena, you, you, I think you actually described that she's not popular domestically, but, but there's, you know, there's really not enough to, to challenge him domestically. And that's pro obviously probably true. But I mean, this, this isn't going to be the same across the region. I think there's going to be, we're seeing backlash now. Um, you know, people don't like corruption, a lack of transparency, you know, arrogance. Uh, uh, we're seeing pushback on, 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 China, uh, based on she, she's, she's actions. Um, and I think at a minute, we're gonna see a region that's less receptive to, to some of China's hawkish uh, policies uh, and, and more likely to try to create challenges for, for Xi to pr pursue some of these. Um, and, and Larry, you mentioned some specific areas, you know, we maybe look at South China Sea, uh, I'll just run through a few examples where I think we're seeing some pushback. I mean, look at the reckless Chinese aggression, You're sinking Philippines, uh, Vietnamese fishing vessels, interfering with freedom of navigation, uh, the activities of their maritime militias, um, you know, still continue ongoing improvements of, of these uh, features in these disputed areas, militarization of these features, and, and really making them, uh, de, you know, de facto military bases. 
you know, more broadly in the region, you know, the Southeast Asia, we're seeing pushback. I mean, let's look at the Philippines as I think just a great example. I mean, think, think back to 2016 when, when President Duterte came on board and, the, you know, the disturbing slide towards China, him declaring that he's switching allegiances and, and you know, all the money and, and investment that China promised, uh, really, really disturbing for, for uh, you know, a, a U.S. treaty ally to be be saying this, but boy, you look at the last few months, you know, this is after China kind of never came through on its loans, uh, you know, China, you know, encroaching on Philippines sovereignty, you know, that in, 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 this, in, the, in the South China Sea, uh, uh, dis, you know, in the Philippines of any country had, a, you know, uh, an arbitral court ruling that, that declared, you know, China's claims uh, that had no basis in international law. So, I mean, now China's, I mean, now the Philippines, you know, they're back in the visiting forces agreement, they're you know, their, their foreign minister, if you read one of his tweets a, a couple of months back, you know, with full of expletives describing uh, their, their views about China's uh, aggression. So, um, and, and it's not just the Philippines, you know, there's countries across Southeast Asia, I think, are, are really, uh, you know, kind of seeing the, the, the wolf for, for, for what it is and, 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 and she for, for who he is and who he's going to continue to be. And I think we're going to see a lot of pushback. You know, moving to South Asia, I mean, wow, we're, we're going to talk about this a bit later, I think, Larry, but you know, those border clashes uh, with India, you know, that was really, I think, what, what created the, the, the conditions to, 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 for, for India to have this epiphany that, hey, we, we, can, we can be visibly, uh, uh, you know, we can participate in the Quad. We, we can consider military cooperation, security cooperation that we had never before. Um, so certainly China's activities there on the Indian border, um, you know, going back to Doklam in, 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 I think, 2017, is certainly driving a lot, a lot of... Uh, Outrage certainly domestically in India, and we're seeing that that translate and manifest itself in, in, in some pretty significant um, changes in, in India's, uh, you know, international policies. Certainly with respect to uh, uh, working with allies and partners, or working with partners across the region, um, and in other areas. So, so there, I'm going to leave it there. But I would just say I think Winning is exactly right. That there, there's maybe maybe not enough to push back domestically, but but I think we're going to continue to see the, this 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 hawkish behavior from from Xi. And we're going to see even more backlash across the region and, and those areas we, we discussed, you know, South China Sea, Southeast Asia, South Asia. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's there's a growing awareness that, that we, we know who she is and where he wants to take things. And, and it's not in the interest of a lot of countries. And I think we're going to see some cooperation to push back on that. Uh, I, I'm going to want to uh, ask Ling Ling uh, uh, to comment further on the possible link between domestic politics and, and regional instability. But before I do, Joe, uh, since you've mentioned the Quad, let, let's go directly to it. Um, uh, this didn't really conceptually get born just a few years ago, but it took on uh, a seriousness and level of activity uh, uh, only in the last few years and with a big investment by people like you, I must say with considerable uh, appreciation, if I can s speak personally. So could you give your own assessment of where this unusual uh, and maybe historically unlikely grouping of the US, uh, Japan, Australia, and India stands today and uh, you know, what, what does the Quad conceive of itself as it's not a military alliance, but it is, a, I guess, some kind of community of concern uh, in the positive sense about stability and balance in the region. And I, I think you don't have to go very far beneath the surface to see it's an effort to ensure that there's no effort, on, no success on the part of the PRC to uh, impose a kind of hegemony on the region. Sure, Larry, thank you. And, and thanks for, for all your support as we, some of our activities in this space uh, here, here at Stanford uh, and, and beyond. Um, but hey, this is, these are really promising developments. And, and Larry, I may, I may actually push back a little bit on th this unusual group. I mean, getting back to maybe classic international relations theory, I mean, in countries cooperate based on shared interests. And here we have the four largest democracies in the region, strong economies, you know, sh shared values, shared interests. I, I think, um, I think it's a natural uh, that, that they would look for opportunities to cooperate. And you know, and to date, or until recently, a, a 
to use a, a term you may not be familiar with, a long pole intent was was India cooperation. You know, the, the, the other Australia, uh, Japan, and U.S. are, are treaty allies. Uh, so, but and again, thanks to Xi Jinping and and uh, the Communist Party, uh, India's kind of woken up to the fact that uh, we need to cooperate um, to to advance and protect our, our shared interests. Um, but but very important. It, it is not meant to be a, a military grouping. It's 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 not designed to become uh, uh, an Asian NATO. Uh, but you think about the the the, the it's the, the quasi it's forming habits of cooperation that that you know military cooperation cooperation could be facilitated. I mean, cooperating in some areas, um, health, uh, disaster relief, and in some of the other areas, it, it's going to create. And it, it's not lost in China that you know as benign as as the Quad's activities are now. Um, it certainly uh, uh, it, it certainly it demonstrates the potential if, if required and, and under duress to 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 to, to uh, increase its security cooperation to include military cooperation. Um, you know, you think some of the, the focus areas, and Larry, you recall from our of our, our track 1.5 a few weeks ago here at Stanford, but um, so some of the, the focus areas, um, you know, it, we've got COVID and global health, which what, what how can China push back on that? The infrastructure, uh, climate, uh, they do people to people exchanges, education. Uh, critical emerging technologies, cybersecurity and space. So, so these are all areas where cooperation amongst these four large democracies with strong economies is is, is going to be you know critical. Um, and, and, and importantly, there it's it's not an exclusive club of these four countries alone. Um, it's really designed to facilitate greater cooperation of, from all countries in the Indo-Pacific. You know, because uh, you know I, I remember in my my last job, uh, it was very important every stop I'd make in the region says we're, we're not asking. You to choose between the U.S. and China. We're asking you to choose your own sovereignty, choose your own interests, and, and choose the to cooperate with with those those partners that are going to help you um, defend your own sovereignty. And I think this is an example where cooperating with you know countries across the Quad and the Quad itself is is is, is a better choice as far as a, a ch choosing a, a state's own sovereignty and, and and the relationships and, and cooperation with, with with those that can help them defend that. And I can talk a lot more about the quad later, but, but over to you to steer us back into some other areas if, uh, if I'm getting off base. Okay, so thank you, Joe, for laying that out. Um, Ling Ling, let me ask you to try and link um, the domestic trends, uh, political and economic, to possible directions of China's regional uh, and more broadly external behavior um, with the following concerns. Uh, first of all, um, there's some real economic problems in China now, which you've referred to and reported on. Um, the entire kind of financial sector, particularly that massive portion of it that's been propping up all these real estate investments uh, is in pretty serious difficulty. Uh, you've got this massive um, uh, real estate uh, investment company, development company, Evergrande, that's in bankruptcy. Uh, a lot of people at risk of losing, if not their life savings in these investments, a pretty significant portion of that. Uh, and who knows what other and, and and you know he will and and uh, China's uh, financial managers probably will figure out a way to keep this from becoming an economic catastrophe. But there's a pretty serious uh, economic problem in China now. And looking over the horizon, you don't have to look too far to see the demographic challenges, the rapid aging of the Chinese population, the environmental difficulties, and so on. Uh, and then there's COVID, and who knows what else might emerge that we can't anticipate now. One possibility uh, that people speculate about is that um, the problems, not the power, the problems will moderate him uh, in terms of his international behavior uh, into kind of using his mental and financial and political resources to address uh, China's domestic problems. A and the other scenario is a kind of wag the dog scenario that uh, if he's really coming into difficulty, criticism, crisis, and so on, uh, he will stir Chinese nationalism uh, as he already seems to be doing uh, and maybe prepare uh, to play the big card 
that he's been alluding to uh, and raising increasing threats about, namely Taiwan. So how do you think these domestic challenges may play into his regional posture uh, in terms of either restraining or unleashing uh, potential aggressiveness? Uh, thank you for the question. It's a really a uh, very broad and um, uh, huge question. Um, I do think that um, you know when, when I talk to some economists and government officials in China, you know, more liberal minded, and um, you know, they there is a sense that um, China might have gone a little bit too far with this kind of aggression, right, on the global stage. Um, it's almost like, um, you know, they're, they're picking a fight these days. Uh, as Joe pointed out, thank God to Xi Jinping, now the allies are, you know, moving closer to the US after four years of Trump. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's, it's really hard to see that um, there is going to be a big shift in China's foreign policy, uh, it, you know, in the near and medium term, um, you know, obviously people are talking about if there's a crisis, especially the economic crisis you are alluding to, that would force the um, the top leadership to become more pragmatic again, right? To do some kind of course correction. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of that, you know, the latest economic works conference. Uh, we are seeing that there might be a little bit pulling back from, you know, the very aggressive crackdown private bosses and, and trying to reestablish the pro-growth policies. But, but I don't think, um, you know, those changes on the margin would uh, amount to a more significant shift in policy. I think, um, you know, we have to consider what kind of leader she is, right? Um, China, uh, I know a lot of people think Chinese politics are very much institutionalized these days. You know, I, I, I am of a very different opinion. I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor um, Joe Fusmith at Boston University, a very long time China watcher. It's, it's anything but institutionalized. So personalities really drive a lot of those things. Um, she really is more ideological forceful than a lot uh, than his predecessors, Jiang Zemin and, and Hu Jintao, he really wants to, you know, basically make the Chinese proud of being Chinese. So what that means, that means be confident in your own system, right? Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the aggression he's, um, uh, you know, uh, shown on, on in the regional matters and global matters, as Joe pointed out, um, you know, it's, it, he actually had got a lot of popular support. His popularity um, ha has risen within China because you know he's shown that he's willing to protect China's interests outside of China. So uh, I, I don't think he's going to back down from that kind of stance. Um, and, and also in terms of economy, I know I, I've listed a list of uh, problems and challenges China's economy is facing, but I really don't think there's going to be, you know, a, a, a collapse in growth because China, the size of the China's uh, economy is, is there. And, and, and um, you know, of course, one can argue China's economy should be growing at 10%, 15% a year, as opposed to maybe 5% this year. Uh, if the government has the right policy. So even you know, without the right policy, because of the size uh, of, of the economy and how dynamic the country remains, um, I, I don't really foresee a, a collapse, but it's more a um, you know, slow motion uh, train wreck, uh, so to speak. Um, so I, I, I really don't see um, you know, a, a huge shift in, in foreign policy going forward. And the one more thing I would add is, you know, what's really, uh, how do you define the new era of development in China these days? I think the biggest feature of this new uh, era of development is competition with the US, 
and possibly confrontation. So uh, everything she's doing is gonna revolve around um, that that key feature. Once he, you know, consolidates his power even more and um, you know secures his um, third terms and more terms. So Ling Ling, let me put the question to you this way. Um... You said you don't see a significant change away from uh, China's posture uh, in in the region and maybe globally. Uh, and I think you meant by that it's assert it's assertiveness and even a kind of edgy wolf warrior character to it. Um, but might it change in the other direction? There's been this edginess. There's been uh, this claim to the whole South China Sea. There's been the growing encroachment on uh, fishing resources, the construction of um, military bases out of nothing in the South China Sea. And there's been the growing pattern of intrusion now, I think on a daily basis into Taiwan's air identification zone, but there hasn't been an actual use of force against Taiwan or an ultimatum to Taiwan. Um, uh, there are some pretty smart people in, in American uh, foreign policy and national security, uh, including some people uh, Joe worked with in the last administration, and another one of my colleagues at Stanford, Oriana Mastro, who wrote recently in Foreign Affairs, that she thinks on the basis of her expert study of the Chinese military and national security system that, you know, China could actually use force against Taiwan, not 10 years from now, but you know, within the next couple of years. So uh, let me then pose it this way. Uh, do you think there is a danger that she's consolidation of power, the mounting domestic problems, not existential, but bad enough, could prompt him with a new sense of mission and having now eliminated term limits to just say sooner than we imagined, uh, time's up, Taiwan, uh, reunify or we'll do it for you. Uh, that would be a huge gamble on his part. Um, I, I do realize, you know, the, uh, a lot of people, myself included, uh, really worried about the Taiwan situation. And um, you know the rhetoric of uh, Beijing is um, doing over Taiwan is very much heated these days, right? Um, but I, I I want to throw in another idea, one idea that I, I learned from actually just talking to to my dad uh, about this issue. Um, you know, um, uh, the you know I I think a lot of people kind of overlook the. This, this fact that taking Taiwan in the envision would be far more difficult than some in Beijing have made it out to be, probably even more so than the Allied invasion of Normandy during World War II because of rough seas and distance from the mainland. So um, my dad used to be in military uh, before he retired many years ago. When he was a young soldier, he worked for a uh, uh, People's Liberation Army General. His name is Xiao Feng. Uh, Xiao Feng uh, was very, very well known in China. He basically directed the whole battle of Tianmen in 1949. Uh, you'll know the outcome of that battle. Uh, Xiao at the time was a very much decorated Red Army warrior and deeply trusted by Mao Zedong. But he failed at that battle and you know, his strategy basically cost the lives of 9,000 Chinese soldiers. Mao almost had Xiao killed following the battle, but instead settled for demoting him three levels. Can, we can all imagine if had he you know, won that battle, what, what the world would be like now. So anyway, to this day, and the reason I'm mentioning that little story is that to this day, some in the official circles, even in the military, would still think back on that battle and that thought would make them cringe. So despite the very tough talks by people, you know, like some nationalist commentators in China, um, 
um, and, and the China's own military buildup, uh, it, it's really hard to see, at least for me, the leadership have settled on a coherent Taiwan strategy as of yet. You know, I think they must have been realistic enough to realize that the one country, two system approach wouldn't work for Taiwan. But what's the alternative? That's where the debate still going on. You know, um, even in China these days, there are even um, you know, some, room, uh, some, some speculation that the US is trying to provoke China into invading Taiwan because that would really um, you know, be a catastrophe for, for China. Um, so the U.S. would 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 gain from from a battle like that. So you, you see, you know, the yes, you know, in terms of sentiment, in, in terms of public sentiment, in terms of the the official sentiment, it's overwhelmingly oh, we we you know, Taiwan's part of China, you know, and we we are so strong. It's almost only a matter of time um, to take uh, you know for us to take China back. The, the, the rhetoric is on. Uh, are mistaken, but however, you know, in the, the specific timing is very much um, debatable, and I I think it's very interesting uh, thing we should be on the lookout for is how many terms Xi Jinping will remain in power. If it's another fifteen years, that's the time frame for um, China finally uh, getting Taiwan back. Not the next two years. Okay, good. Um... Well, uh, I uh, have not served in the government uh, and certainly not uh, at the level Joe has, but I think I know enough about U.S. government thinking to think there is nobody in the U.S. government that wants to uh, provoke China into military action against Taiwan. But Joe, before I go to questions, um, let me first invite our audience to pose their questions in the Q&A box. And second of all, uh, ask you to comment on uh, on this Taiwan question and what Ling Ling has said. I agree with Ling that it, it is it is a pretty difficult uh, prospect to, to to successfully you know invade and occupy t Taiwan. I mean, <clears throat> it, from a military perspective, which I can speak with, with you know a bit of experience. I mean, the initial attacks uh, you know against. Um, uh, Taiwan defenses, maybe blockade attacks, missile attacks against some even some U.S. forces in the region, probably pull that off. But you know, to, to, and Lingan, you mentioned this this amphibious assault. This is really tough, you know. To, and, and 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 I just think that Xi Jinping, uh, it would be catastrophic if uh, if he was going to launch this attack and it stalled um, and and was not successful. And and I think um, you know, people argue that they're going to attack when they think they can succeed at, at an acceptable cost. I just don't think they're there yet. Um, and, and I would also agree with Ling that if, if she's timeline probably is the, 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 the timeline he's looking at, I, I think the next few years, it's going to be a bit too risky. I, I, you know, could be proven wrong. I know a lot of people write differently. Uh, I, you know, I, I worked with um, a former Indo-Pacom commander who, who looked, had a more pessimistic view of Phil Davidson. Um, and he's pretty, pretty knowledgeable on the topic, but I, I don't think they're there yet, but, but, uh, you know, shame on us if we don't anticipate that he's doing every that she and and trying to do everything they can to close that gap and and and, and you know have the calculus that they can succeed at, at an acceptable cost. And, and you know, going back to our, our international quad argument, you know, I think a lot of times we look at this too much U.S., Taiwan, and and China. Um, uh, but but boy, if, if there's a lot of opportunities, I think to enlist the support of allies and partners in the region, maybe not for a. Outright commitment to military cooperation, but but raising the cost for for China, you know, increasing the economic cost, you know, knowing that there's going to be huge sanctions. I just think there's a lot of things that um, the U.S. and all those that want to see uh, this the the you know Taiwan not not be uh, annexed by force uh, that they can do to prevent that from happening and, and raise the you know complicate the Chinese calculus that they they can do this successfully. Um, so l let's hope we don't see that. All right, so I'm going to go to the audience questions now, and let's treat this as kind of a lightning round. I'm going to alternate between you and uh, keep your answers relatively concise. We'll start with a question from Andy Rothman, who uh, asks, I'm going to pose it to you, Ling Ling. Um, can we really be so confident that, you know, the policy directions are really emanating from Xi's personal perspective and objectives? rather than reflecting really 
the consensus of the party leadership. In other words, are we putting too much emphasis on she as an individual rather than trying to understand what motivates the broader leadership in Beijing? That's a very good question. Um, so, yes, um, you know, that's always a question, right? You know, who's really calling the shots? And um, I think she has made it pretty clear himself, you know, with all his speeches and writings, you know, how important uh, it is to, you know, follow the very, um, you know, uh, orthodox uh, Marxism and, um, you know, not to uh, uh, criticize and, you know, uh, even draw lessons from any of the mistakes uh, the party has made over the years. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I think, you know, one of the, the biggest, you know, uh, things that are, um, he really has has been pushing for is this kind of ideological purity, party building, um, and um, you know he really tried the past ten years, um, you know, uh, trying to get the remold the whole party into a more disciplined organization, loyal to himself. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest piece of evidence that you know, the governance of China is really following what he wants to do. Um, it, uh, so I, I, I think, but that said, um, obviously I would still think that he still faces constraints. And we, we talked about, you know, a potential economic slowdown, you know, more on structure terms, right? So that kind of constraint is still very much uh, something he has to uh, face and confront. Um, it, if not, you know, direct challenges from any individual, but, but it's on, more on structure terms. He still faces constraints. And, um... My understanding is this ideological campaign is not just within the party, it penetrates institutions across Chinese society. I know uh, professors who are just exasperated with the, you know, renewed kind of Maoist like ideological uh, training uh, and, you know, professions of uh, fidelity to the party mission that they're now expected to, uh, you know, ritually go through all over again as if we were back in the 1960s or 70s. Uh, I would just add on one more thing to the very good point you mentioned, Larry. I think, you know, a lot of people dismiss the idea, you know, to compare Xi to Mao and say the world's apart. I agree with that in China today, it's nothing like, you know, China in the 60s. However, there's there's one thing that China, uh, she really is trying to emulate now, which is uh, mobili uh, mobilization of the masses to galvanize public support to do something he wants to do. I think that that's potentially very dangerous for, for the country's future. It could be dangerous for him too, because once you've mobilized, it's hard to unmobilize and it, <laughs> it could become a runaway train. That's what we worry about in terms of conflict. That's why it's so hard for him to step back from um, consolidating power and ensuring control, right? Yeah. Okay, Joe, a couple of questions uh, about individual uh, uh, countries in the region. Uh, George Ku asks how far this kind of flowering again of American Philippine relations might go. Might it lead? to the welcoming back of American troops or their return to our bases in the Philippines? Is, or is, is Suvik, you know, air, naval base gonna be a naval base again for the United States? What do you envision in that relationship? Uh, no, George, thanks for that question. It's a great one. No, I, I absolutely don't, don't think we'll go back to the, the actual bases era. I think what we're hoping for is to, to have access um, and have the ability to, uh, you know, to, to train uh, this visiting forces agreement that was in the balance here until recently, at least we think it's back on track now, allows us to to train in the region. But no, I don't. You know, there, this is a I hope this isn't misinterpreted. But there, there's a saying that, that I, I had in the Philippines was <clears throat> this is how they describe the U.S. Philippines relationship was Yankee go home, take me with you, which means uh, we they, they they're a proud sovereign country, but we do have this close uh, cultural 
uh, relationship with them. Uh, and, and there's a lot of opportunities there for, for cooperation. Uh, it's, it's not going to be bases. It's, 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 it's against their constitution. Um, but let's hope we have uh, uh, the opportunity to work with them as, as, as a, an ally, a treaty ally, which we have been since 1952, uh, and ensure that, you know, our, it's very important for us to, you know, to protect the Philippines and, and our broader interest in the region to have the type of access that, that we expect uh, a, a, a treaty ally to provide. And it looks like we're getting back on track that, but no, it'll stop short of bases. But let's hope we have rotational troop presence that we, that, that we, we train and then we help the Philippines defend themselves and that we, we're in a position to defend other, other countries and allies and partners in the region with their support. Okay, and then Tom Gold uh, raises a country, Joe, <clears throat> very much not an American ally, uh, but has often, um, been pretty much at the forefront of our thinking about the region, which is North Korea. And the question is how you see that fitting into China's defense and foreign policy calculus and whether there's anything the U.S. could do now, maybe with vaccines or anything else, to um, orient it in a different direction. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've seen, uh, certainly the last few years, and, and longer, you know, North Korea is a wild card. And we do have some aligned interests we have some shared interests with, with China to prevent a you know a, a collapse and and, and the ca catastrophic outcomes that would, would occur from that. So, um, sure, if there's a way to help uh, North Korea through through vaccines and other forms, I, I think there's opportunities for cooperation there. They've always been very challenging. You know, I was uh, serving when uh, former President Trump was really t taking some hail mary shots with uh, North Korea, which maybe well intended, but didn't quite uh, move the ball in the in the way we wanted. So. It's, I mean, let's not forget that there's the nuclear capable country that, uh, you know, let's remember back to 2017, just, you know, when we had literally thought our bases in Guam and even Hawaii was going to be under, under, under threat, and, you know, that, that could, that could turn back on pretty quickly, but uh, North Korea is a wild card. It is, um, I would say, along with Taiwan, one of the most dangerous flashpoints that we're, we're looking at in the world today, and we, we have to cooperate wherever we can to, to reduce that risk. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, Ling Ling, I, I'd like to ask two questions that I think are extremely interesting and interrelated uh, and right up your ally, alley. Um, the first one from Kerr Gibbs is, um, suppose that 20% or less scenario uh, that Kevin Rudd allowed for, and so did you, actually for some reason surfaces uh, and there is a serious challenge to uh, Xi's bid for a third term. Um, what would that look like? What, what issues might be his undoing? And then the second question from Sanket Desai is, um, where would the opposition come from? Uh, you know, from within the Communist Party cadre, from the companies that we think he's beaten back uh, is, there any civil society that can pose a serious challenge? So if you could tackle those together or separately. Uh, sure, the opposition really is coming from, you know, um, all those uh, interest groups uh, and uh, different factions, right? Uh, over the past year, Xi Jinping has tried to put capital into a cage and put other factions into a cage. So his power is the only one that's out there that's not, un that's not caged. Uh, so obviously you're, you're hearing resentment and you know, uh, unhappiness um, uh, you know, among a lot of people. Um, but in terms of general public, uh, the moms and pops on the streets, and I, I have to say you know, so far, if we really believe the, some of the service by uh, Harvard and uh, other um, you know, uh, reputable organizations, and from anecdotal conversations I had with people on the ground, um, he still enjoy very um, high public support, popular support. But it's always internal politics is the most brutal and 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 uh, um, unpredictable. So uh, to Kerr's question, he always asks the <laughs> the, the most difficult question, um, and I, I, I can't imagine if uh, the twenty percent chance, um, if, if that comes to uh, realization, what 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 kind of chaos uh, China would be in? You know, the, the 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 party has tried for decades to ensure smooth transition, right? Uh, succession power, you know, um, and not 
uh, prevent the country uh, from falling to chaos again. So I, I, I really can't Im imagine uh, that that scenario. Let, let, let's hope that, um, you, know, you know, that kind of chaotic um, scenario really, you know, doesn't happen. However, on the other hand, you know, a conversation I recently had with a very liberal minded uh, economist in China, you know, I asked him how optimistic uh, he is about China's future these days, you know, compared to uh, five years ago. And his answer is, is very telling. He said, I am still optimistic for China, but only after Xi Jinping. Sounds a little like the famous Gramsci quote, uh, pessimism of the intellect, <laughs> optimism of the will. Um, let me return to the uh, Taiwan issue in, in the way that Philip Wong has phrased it uh, for you, Ling Ling. If you can get even a little more deeply into the mind of Xi Jinping, because you, you've, you've started to do so in interesting ways, uh, the degree to which he takes ideology more seriously, his uh, stimulation of Chinese nationalism. Um, how important is it to Xi personally uh, that, that China eventually take control over Taiwan? That is, you've predicted that, well, if he's got another two, three terms, China's uh, going to move. Is that inevitable under Xi Jinping? Uh, are there factors that could alter his thinking or if he has a timetable, his timetable? Uh, the Taiwan issue is hugely important for Xi. Um, it's, it's basically a, a central part of the China dream. Uh, China dream is not about uh, just about, you know, economic development and, you know, China become a, 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 a stronger country militarily, um, geographically, um, but also just a, a fully reunified country under uh, the party's leadership. That's how we define the China dream. So it's hugely important for him. And, and also, you know, if it's indeed the case, and, you know, he's going to serve not just one term, but two terms, so even three terms, how do you really justify that? Right? Um, Mao Zedong justified that because he built China. Uh, Deng Xiaoping justified his extended influence on Chinese politics because he made China rich. So Xi Jinping would have to justify that by really proving that he can make China strong, strong by all accounts, not just economically, but you know, a, a, a one country, a, a reunified country. So, so it's it's really very important for him. Um, and you know, the timetable ob obviously is is a huge question and a specific strategy. And I, I do think he's he still has time. He still also thinks uh, he has time to to really um, have have a plan. I don't think the party uh, has a consensus yet. Great. Um... And it, it kind of reminds me of what many people have been saying that, uh, you know, uh, Jiang Zemin could say, well, I did my best. I've only had 10 years. I turn it over to my successor. Hu Jintao could say the same thing. I've only had 10 years. Uh, if Xi Jinping is there for 20 years, he won't be able to say that. I'll close and we only have a couple minutes, Joe. Uh, with an, another leader who's already been there 20 years and who's been in pretty deep and um, uh, we don't know the full scope of it, but you know, one presumes a potentially worrisome interaction uh, with this uh, authoritarian leader and regime. Uh, and that is Vladimir Putin, who in the near term uh, is much more likely to be an author of overt military aggression against a neighbor. Uh, so uh, what can you tell us, uh, Charlie Wang asks, about uh, the role uh, Russia may play uh, in China's calculations and in, in its, uh, its security uh, dispositions? Uh, is it becoming an ally of China? And how should we think about the Russia-China-Putin-Xi relationship? Larry, I mean, I, th I think there are, 
again, going back to international relations theory, which I started my, my comments with, it's, it's good old fashioned great power politics. You know, I think they, they've got aligned interest in, uh, uh, as far as viewing the, the U S as a, <clears throat> as a competitor. So they, they, they certainly have a, um, an interest in cooperating now, but th it's not that deep. You know, there's too many divisions, too many differences, I think, to predict a, a longer term, certainly on a line. So I'm looking at uh, Ch Charlie's question here. Uh, yeah, and, and I'll have convenience, I think, is the more accurate description, uh, but certainly they can do a lot of damage working together now in the near term. Um, and we need to be vigilant and anticipate, um, but, 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 but Russia and China are very, very different countries, uh, but certainly align on the interest in, 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 in cooperating and in, in competing more effectively with, with, with the United States and her allies. So. Uh, uh, I, I think the real threat is in the near term, not the medium to long term. Well, uh, Ling Ling Wei and Joe Felter, uh, thank you so much for uh, your remarkable, uh, stimulating uh, insights. Uh, and thank you to the Asia, Found Asia Society for uh, this remarkable day, uh, and particularly the Asia Society of Northern California. Our, our partner and dear friend uh, from the perspective of Stanford University. So uh, uh, Margaret and Gary, I turn it over to you now with my sincere personal thanks for a great thanks. day. Thanks so much, Larry. It's great to partner with you in Silicon Valley at Stanford and thanks to Joseph and Ling Ling. I really wish that we had more time for these sessions. It was a fascinating conversation, lots to think about and we learned a lot from you, so thank you. And now for our closing remarks, please welcome back our chair, Gary Rochelle. It's a, as Margaret said, um, every one of these panels and every one of these conversations would have been worth uh, a very, very long dinner with lots of good wine. And so hopefully at some point when we can get together in the future, we'll be able to do that. I was reflecting, I guess there's one takeaway for the day for me that I that I would uh, you know think about, which is to me, when you look between the US and China, it's gonna come down to which country acts more as a unifying force if we look out over the next decade, because clearly the issues that the world faces, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's data uh, ownership, uh, the use of uh, gene editing, all the issues that we think about as big issues require both those countries to work together, but that's not gonna be enough. And it's really gonna be down to who acts as a unifying force from a values and theme perspective to really bring the rest of the world behind them. And I think uh, it'll, it's, it's, I wish it was not an open question right now, but I think it's, it's something that uh, we should pay attention to. Um, I was reflecting when Margaret asked me to make some closing comments. One, they'll be brief. Number two, I was thinking about Rockefeller 65 years ago when he started the Asia Society. And when you look at the quote on, well, when he was asked, why did you start, why did you create the Asia Society? He said, to contribute to broader and deeper understandings between the peoples of the U.S. and Asia. What he did not say was, he did not say between the countries of Asia. And so we need to make sure we don't lose track of the people and the fact that our organization is really focused on a very, very deep understanding, not of today's geopolitical realities or today's geopolitical concerns, but really understanding the people of an entire region of the world and how, that, how they interact with, uh, you know, with the United States. And we should not forget that distinction. Um, and as important as the US and China are to each other, we need to also remember that the Asia Society mission compels us to appreciate the broader context of Asia. Um, hopefully the Asia Society role in promoting understanding between the peoples of the US and Asia will encourage more discussion and engagement leading to healthy and robust mutual development. Engagement's the key word there. I heard nothing today that says engaging less between the US and China is gonna help anyone. And I haven't heard anyone say with the US engaging less in the world is gonna help anyone. Um, as we look forward to, as we look forward to all these different challenges, no organization is better positioned, uh, I believe, uh, to help address that ambitious agenda in the Asia Society. Um, what Kevin has done with his leadership at the broader group, uh, what Orville and Kevin have put together within the policy framework, um, what we're talking about with the future development has really put the organization in a very strong footing. And it's something that uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm privileged and honored to, uh, you know, to be able to help um, guide in some, in some small way. So with that, I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end early. I warned Margaret, I'm not gonna have 10 minutes of comments. 
And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, you know Margaret. And but before she thanks everyone, I would just also offer my appreciation for the incredible amount of work and energy, not only from participants and our staff, but also the sponsors and everyone who made this day possible. So thank you. Thank you, Gary. That's a wonderful way to close, and we appreciate your leadership and you as our chair of Northern California. And thank you again to all of our speakers. We learned a lot from you today. Thank you again to our sponsors. We're so grateful for your support for our work. If you in the audience would like to join us as a member or donate, please visit our website, or you can click on the QR code that's gonna come up on the slide that's gonna be shown at the very end of this program. For those joining our VIP reception, click over now to that second Zoom link that we emailed to you. This is for our sponsors, board, Groundbreaker and Innovator members. We're gonna continue the conversation there with all of our speakers. A big, big, big thank you to our Asia Society Northern California team who has worked for months to put this conference together. They pulled it off and the pivot to virtual seamlessly, Rex Laui, James Gale, Angela Chung, and Rahul Devaskar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're also grateful to our interns and volunteers for their hard work too. We look forward to actually seeing everyone this 2022. Thank you all for joining us.